you can't just talk to one or two employees and, and take anecdotal feedback and say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to change, you know, X, Y and Z based on these one or two opinions. When you have, you know, a larger group of people that may be feeling a different way, um, then you run the risk of just either, you know, paving those cow paths, meaning the relationships that you already have or the trusted relationships that exist. Um, or two, just listening to the, you know, the loudest voice in the room or the squeakiest wheel. Um, so collecting data um, holistically, being really intentional about how you collect those data points and, and better understand the sentiment is important. Um, and there are a number of tools out there in which you can do that. Um, but but when you're really thinking about building a culture uh, or building a company from the ground up and being intentional about that, that culture, um, the funny thing is, is I... I've been studying culture, you know, for for 10 years um, exclusively and probably my entire life, uh, you know, more anecdotally or, um, you know, just independently. So I, I have a lot of words to say, but at the end of the day, um, and I know that we aren't supposed to use this word that much, but it really is a feeling and it, it's that, that connection and that connectivity. And so understanding... Um, and being connected to the people in your organization must come first. And so I can give you frameworks and I can give you best practices and I can start with, you know, an exercise around what makes a great mission statement, what makes a great vision statement, how do we define our values, what makes successful values. And I could talk about the founder toolkit until I'm blue in the face. I have, I have templates out the wazoo, uh, which are helpful to organize your thoughts as, you know, a, a young founder or a young business is trying to establish itself. And, and those tools are super handy, right? They, they are great. It helps you find clarity in your thoughts um, because typically a founder is, is being pulled mentally, emotionally in a million different directions around product market fit and, and sales and product adoption and building a team and all of the, these other things that their investors um, are requiring of them uh, to, to do in a short period of time. Uh, and so the, the, the weight of, oh, I need to think about culture now too, uh, can be fairly overwhelming, um, especially when you don't know where to start or when you're just a few people and, and you say, oh, well, I'll, I'll worry about that later. Um, but the reality is, is, yeah, exactly. Like, or I've worked with them before or know each other. So it's fine. Um, yeah. But the 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 healthiest thing that you can do is talk about it early and talk about it often, even if it is, you know, simple or uh, not yet defined. Um, that's OK. It's about the, the really early culture definition really is about the working dynamic and relationship that, that you have on the team and how you're. Um, you know, ensuring that you are giving those feedback cycles and that your your communication lines are open and that you are focused on the right things. And so, you know, really early culture, I know it sounds silly or even heartless, but a lot of it is around communication and goal setting, um, which doesn't feel like any of that meaty stuff that I was talking about um, because you're busy building. And so you, you don't, if you don't have that focus and alignment, even just between two co-founders um, or an, or, you know, a founder and an early team member, uh, you're, you're going to hit that wall of this isn't working. Um, as opposed to, you know, in a, in a larger organization where you, you start to have a, a coup or a mutiny and people are like, this place sucks or I, I'm frustrated. <laughs> Um, but in those early days, when a, when a culture isn't isn't going well or isn't developing well, it's because you have a communication gap um, mm -hmm. or an integrity breach. When one person does things one way and another wants to do them another way, um, and and that's viewed as a as a breach. And so it, it's small and subtle, but it really is at the end of the day. Um, not at the end of the day, at the start of the day, uh, about human connection and and communication. Yeah, it doesn't even seem like a less lesser uh, aspect of culture to sort of set explicit goals. Like sometimes the problem in culture is the explicit. Sometimes it's the ex implicit. You can't really tell uh, beforehand. Absolutely. And, and oftentimes it's a, it's a combination of both, right? So yeah. you, there, I, I view culture as like a, a control uh, center where you have knobs that you can you, you can tweak and dial and and you have levers that you can say let's try this oh that doesn't work turn that off turn this on this louder this more quiet um, and it's really about that that nuance and that attention to the control center yeah. and just to clarify uh, because one word that was like at least 
explicitly missing from from your hierarchy or your listing was the like why of the company is it kind of like the and is it encircling everything that's like because you know from from the why of course derives basically everything uh, without a clear purpose of the company you can't have any values you can't have a mission you people don't know what they're working with so is it like is it integrated with the founders or is it just like it's basically everywhere uh, along this <laughs> this um, uh, listing that's an interesting question um because a lot of people use why as as in their cultural definition um <clears throat> i and i don't really have a succinct answer on this um so i will i will do my best to not get too wordy the long uh, ones have been good so far. Don't worry. It, <laughs> very, very good. Um, thank you for your patience with me. Um, I, I believe that the why is deeply embedded in the mission and the vision. And sometimes the why changes. Um, in all cases, all components of culture need to shift and change, um, even values. That's something that I learned early on um, in my experience at Reddit was, the, the most effective use of values is to, you know, they are both aspirational and inspirational, but they are used to, to drive change in behavior. And uh, I, I once thought early in my career that values should be your values always and forever. The, you know, this is the, the core, um, you know, it's, it's our integrity component, right? Um, but the reality is, is, is what we are seeing more and more often now is that people are separating values from um, like a code of conduct or a code of ethics. So creating a space where, for for example, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, a lot of people want to turn that into a value as, as if it's something we they, they want to state, they want to make a statement internally, they want to make a statement externally, that these are things that we value. But the reality is, is, is you can't encapsulate diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging into a value that it, you can actually operationalize. But you can make the statement, diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging are deeply important to us. And in fact, it's a table stake, right? This is something, this is a non-negotiable. We will build a diverse, a inclusive, you know, an equitable uh, workplace that has the feeling of belonging. And, and so you state that somewhere else, but that's not a value. And so when you ask about why, where does the why live? Um, all of these things are fluid. All of these things are constantly evolving and they should be evolving as you, the founder, as, as you, a leader within the organization, are evaluating, are these things driving our business forward? Are we achieving, are we on track to achieve our mission and our vision? And like I said, sometimes that mission and that vision change or have to shift. Um, and, and it's a good and it's a healthy thing. Um, so the why lives in, I mean, you said it best, you should, you should give the long answer. It lives <laughs> in, in every single part of, of what we do. Um, that should be the reason, like I said, when, when your feet hit the ground out of bed in the morning, the why might be different for you than it is for me. Um, like I, I gave the example earlier about Pixar, like, inviting people into a dark room and hope that they feel something um, wasn't my only why. You know, I, I have two little kids that are in my, my bunker with me. Um, they're a part of my why. Uh, you know, wanting to, to have a lasting impact on the world and, and be a part of something that is making the world better, that's a part of my why. So I, I think that why should be embedded in most explicitly in the mission and the vision it's woven throughout, you know, the fabric of, of what it is that we're building with our culture. But I also believe that the why is deeply, deeply personal. And it's okay for everyone to have their own why and still show up and, and as the who and the how, as I describe culture. Um, the why doesn't matter. I don't care if every single person sitting at that table showed up for 20 different reasons that are not aligned so long as they know how they're going to get this work done together and they are aligned around the, the value set and, and the, the company mission. Why is important, but it's, it doesn't, it's not important to be individually defined.